Welcome back. Linear programming, part one. Good old unit eight. Let's uh, do some mathematical formulation of these problems. And as you can kind of see with looking at the Electrolec, Electrotech Corporation example here, whoa, that's a pretty beefy question. Right? And it looks like it's going to be hard and complicated to digest and, and so on. But remember, we have our, our three-step procedure. As long as we follow the three steps, we're going to be fine. Okay? So first step is we need to find out what those decision variables are. So when I'm reading that question, I'm going to be thinking in terms of what is it that I want to know that I don't already know. Next thing I'm going to be thinking about is what's my objective function? What am I maximizing? What am I minimizing? And then the third thing I'll be thinking about when I'm reading this question is what are my constraints? What are my limitations? Right? What limitations on resources is being placed upon us? Or what kind of um, certain minimums or requirements are being placed on us? Okay, so let's read the question. The electrolec, boy, good thing I'm in the teaching business, eh? Can't talk. Uh, the elect electrotech corporation manufactures two industrial sized electrical devices generators and alternators both of these products require wiring and testing during the assembly process okay so right there i'm starting to think require require sounds like a constraint right? it looks like i have a wiring constraint and a testing constraint right now Looks like I have two products. I'm making generators and I'm making alternators. So I'm in the generator business and I'm in the alternator business. So that's kind of like the, 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 the first couple of sentences is giving me a sense for what the decision variable might be. It's also getting, giving me a sense for potential constraints. Each generator requires, again, there's a require, kind of a key constraint kind of word, two hours of wiring and one hour of testing requires and can be sold for a $250 profit. Ooh, kind of giving me a sense that I want to maximize that profit. Uh, each uh, alternator requires uh, three hours of wiring and two hours of testing and can be sold for a $150 profit. There are 260 hours of wiring time and 140 hours of testing time available. Sounds like a capacity constraint. In the next production period, an electro tech wants to maximize profit. Aha! Objective function solid now. Formulate an algebraic, uh, sorry, formulate an LP problem for this, uh, sorry, formulate an LP model for this problem and then we'll solve it graphically. Okay, so what am I deciding upon? Right? I want to maximize profit. How do I maximize profit? Well, I get profit off of selling generators. I get profit from selling alternators. So ultimately, I must be deciding upon the number of alternators and the number of generators to produce. Remember, both decision variables have to be in the objective function. So it doesn't say it doesn't say you know decide upon this. We just maximize profit. We have an objective function, but we're in the the generator business. We're in the alternator business. We get profit depending on the number of generators we produce and the number of alternators we produce. Okay, so my decision variables, I am going to just say that let G equal the number of generators to produce or manufacture, and let A, A for alternator, equal the number of alternators to produce. Okay, I, I just made a G and A so that I can keep track of it. You can do X and Y, you can do A, a and B, you can do you know, J and K if you want, uh, but I would suggest that you pick a letter that kind of fits, the, fits uh, the item that you're trying to uh, decide upon. Okay. So there's my decision variables. My next step is going to be my objective function. And I know that I want to maximize profit because it tells me this. And then I need to determine, well, how do I calculate profit? Well, I get, uh, it tells me here I get $250 for each generator times by the number of generators that we produce. That's my total profit from the generator business. I add to that the $150 I get from each alternator times by the number of alternators I produce 
right, to give my total profit from the alternator business. Add them both together, here's my maximum profit. Next step is off to the constraints. I'm going to kind of note the constraints in words first, then I'll worry about, you know, mathematical formulation. This just helps keep me organized so I don't get too terribly confused. So I know before I see uh, that there's a wiring requirement. Requirement's kind of like a, a key buzzword for constraints. So I have a wiring requirement. I have also a testing requirement. And those are the two explicit ones mentioned there. Okay. Well, there's gonna, there's a there's a little twist of the story that'll come on up at the end. So how do I determine uh, its wiring time? And I see that each generator require requires two hours of wiring time. So if I take two times by the number of generators, that's how much total wiring time generators require. Then I add to that, and what, okay, alternators, do they require wiring? They do. They require three hours of wiring time. Again, times by the total number of alternators that I manufacture. Add them together, that's my total wiring time requ um, requirement. Now, I only have a certain amount of wiring time available, and that's 260 hours. Now, I can use less than 260 hours, but I cannot use more than 260 hours. I can use exactly 260 hours, so the equality uh, sign is important there, but I can't go to 261 or 260.2 or anything like that. I have 260 is good or less than 260, hence the less than or equal to. Now, I have a testing requirement. Now, let's look at testing, and I see, okay, one hour for each generator, times by the number of generators, total testing requirement, testing required, and two hours for the alternator. So plus two times every alternator, and total amount available less than or equal to 140, okay? Can't use more than 140, I can use 140, I use 139 as well, that's perfectly fine. Now, there's two other kind of implicit uh, assumptions that are in the background that we need to consider. One of the implicit uh, requirements is a non-negativity. Can't make a negative amount of generators. Can't make a negative amount of alternators. So what that just means is G is got to be greater than or equal to zero, and A has got to be greater than or equal to zero. We can produce nothing. We just can't produce a negative amount. And the next one is integers. This sometimes is, is important, sometimes it's not. But nobody wants half a generator. Nobody wants half an alternator. Okay, so uh, G and A are integers. That's sufficient, you can, you know, there's a fancy way to say it, and it belongs to the set of integers, which is a Z and all that kind of stuff, if you want. But just G and A are integers, right? Now, those two constraints, they're implicit, right? They're common sense to us, right? But they're not explicitly stated in the question. So there's two constraints we always have to consider, but they're not going to be explicit in the question. And there's our mathematical formulation right there, from decision variable to objective function, right, to constraints. Boom, boom, boom. Three steps. That's it. That's the whole mathematical formulation of this problem. So, so not tremendously painful. Next step, solving this graphically. Now, the graphically part will pulse all that, those basic tools we learned in Unit 6, put them into uh, this particular problem. Okay, so let's do this uh, graphically. Now, we're going to graph the two constraints. Actually, we're going to graph the three, first three constraints, three types of constraints. We're going to graph the wiring equation, we're going to graph the testing equation, and by non-negativity, that just means we're looking at uh, the positive, positive uh, x's and positive y. Okay, so just the one quadrant. So let's look at the wiring sort of line, and we're going to graph that just like we did in unit six. So two g plus three a equals to two sixty. I want to draw. I want to graph the line. 
Uh, so it's going to be an equal to. And then I'll decide later if it's less than where, where, what, which region uh, is less than, under the line or below or above the line. Okay. So if I'm going to find the intercept. So if g equals to 0, 3a equals to 260. Right? So g is equal to 0, 3a equals 260. A, and I just punched that into my calculator, 86.67, 86.7, 87. We're graphing stuff here, so the, the degree of precision is irrelevant. We'll have precision without accuracy otherwise. Now, I, now next step is I make A is equal to 0. So A is equal to 0. 2G equals to 260. Isolate the G, and I get G is equal to 130. So now I have the two intercepts for the one line. Then I go to the next line. 1G plus 2A equals to 140. Okay. If G is equal to 0, 2A equals to 40, A equals to 70. And if A equals to 0, G just equals to 140. So with that, now I'm I'm set to I'm set to graph this. This is all that's required. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of keep my my sheet with my lines on it, and then I'm gonna graph it. Recommend the ruler with this, um, just because it keeps things a little neater and keeps things a little bit more precise. Okay. So I see that I have, just going back to here, I have the biggest G is 130, the, uh, sorry, yeah. the biggest G is 140, the biggest A is 86.7. Now, so I'm deciding who to put on the x-axis, who to put on the y-axis. It really, it really does not matter who is on the x or who is on the y. It's completely arbitrary because we're, we're not talking about a relationship between one versus the other. They're both sort of somewhat independent of each other. But just by the constraints of the little camera here, I'm going to put A on the y-axis and G on the x-axis, okay? But realistically, it's completely an arbitrary call. So let's kind of go with, um, start there, and it's a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Okay. And that's just my A's starting at zero, going up to 90. Each 10 is, uh, each tick is 10, 10 units of A, or hence, uh, you know, one centimeter. Now, on uh, the G, I gotta go up to 140 here. So I'm gonna go all the way to the end. From zero to 140, whoops. That's 140, 130, 20, and so on. And those are the G's. Okay. So now I'm just going to graph the line looking at my intercepts. So for the constraint regarding wiring, I see I have a G of 130, so 130, 140 out there, and 0, and an A of 86.67, somewhere out there. Okay. Draw a line between the two, right? Because all I need is two points. Draw a line straight across. I'm good. There is my wiring constraint. I am going to label that as wiring so I can keep track of all this. Okay? Next one I'm going to do is the testing constraint. So I have G is equal to 0, A is equal to 70. Right, it's my first point, and then G is equal to 140, 
and A is equal to zero. Draw my straight line, and I have that constraint, which I will call testing. So there is that A has to be equal to zero, so that's kind of like putting a constraint along the A axis. And G must be greater than or equal to zero, which is like putting a constraint along this axis. Okay. So my next step is I'm going to draw the feasible region. I'm going to start off with the non-negativity constraints because they're easier. A is greater than or equal to zero, just means it must be that hey, it's a positive number, right? G is greater than zero, again, must mean that, uh, I mean, sorry, A is greater than zero, must be positive numbers. G is greater than zero, must be positive numbers. Now, for the wiring and the testing time constraints, the origin is very useful, right? So if I think of it, when I look at my wiring constraint, for instance, if I have no generators and no alternators, is that indeed, so zero, zero is the uh, graph coordinate, is that zero plus zero, a number less than 260? And we would say, well, yeah, it is, right? So I know it's underneath, less than is underneath the wiring line. Same kind of thinking for testing. Right? If I again use the coordinate 0, 0, where G is 0 and A is 0, 0 plus 0, is that a, a, a coordinate below 140? Yes, it is. Right? So, yes, it is. So now I think of, okay, what's my feasible region? Remembering one of the early, early slides in the linear programming part. My feasible region is a selection of points where all the constraints are satisfied. Well, where is that? Well, that's right here, right? The selection of points is where all the uh, constraints are satisfied. Okay, great. Now, but we also remember corner points are key important parts, right? We, boundary conditions, corner points, that's so important to us. So what are our corner points? Well, we actually have four of them. We have a corner point at zero, zero. We have a corner point at producing 70A and no Gs. We have a corner point right here at the intersection of the wiring and testing constraints. And we have one other cor corner point here where we produce 130 generators and no alternators, okay? So we have four possible corner point solutions. We know one of those four is a winner. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. We can uh, look at our profit function. Right? So remember our, our profit function from before. And that profit function is 250G plus 150A. And we want it to maximize that profit. Well, by maximizing the profit, it's pretty much likely zero, zero is not going to be the winner for us, right? Because we're going to make zero profit. And we know that for every generator produced, we get $150. So $250. So I produce one generator, I'm already making more money than at the zero, zero. Right? And it's, it would be something that was in the feasible region even, right? So kind of no zero, zero is not out. So common sense tells us that. But what we don't know is which one of these three is the big winner. Now to make that one happen uh, is, is a little trickier. You can plug 70 and 0 into the equation and then whatever this is, which is kind of hard to see, uh, the intersection point between the two and the 130 and 0 in, in, into the maximum, into the profit function, <clears throat> see which one has the biggest profit. I'm just gonna. That's that's kind of like the brute force way of doing it. I'm I'm going to kind of come up with something, uh, maybe a little bit more subtle, but perhaps a tad bit more complicated. The challenge here to drawing out this profit function is that I don't have a profit that that it's equal to. So I have to make an assumption 
Okay, it's a major source of confusion right here. I have to make an assumption on profit. It doesn't have to be the right number. In fact, it will not be the right number. It will not be the answer. I make an assumption, and this assumption is trial and error. So I'm going to say it again only because it's a major source of confusion and questions. The assumption is just a source of trial and error. And so what did I do? What was my trial and error? I multiplied 250 times 150, divided it by 10 to get a low number that is below my corner point solutions, right? And so that I can manipulate it. So I assume profit equals to 37.50. And again, can't stress it enough, this is not the actual maximum profit, okay? And so if it equals to 37.50, 250 G plus 150 A, right? And now I find my intercepts in the normal course of business. If G is equal to zero, A is going to be equal to 25. And if A is equal to zero, G is going to equal to 15. Okay. And again, that is just an assumption. It is not the answer. The answer is we don't know what it is yet. So A, G is equal to zero. A is equal to 25, which is about there. And if A is equal to 0, G is equal to 15, which is about there. Okay. So that sort of gives me an, an initial point for my first profit calculation. Okay. And so that's my initial point. And profit equals to 37.50. Okay. Now, we could tell that there are points in the feasible region that satisfy all the constraints where we can make more money. Because remember, if I sell more generators, I sell more alternators, I make more money. I look at the coefficients for G, it's 250. I look at the coefficient for A, it's 150. Every time G goes up, I make another $250 worth of profit. Every time A goes up, I make another, I make $150 worth of profit. So if I take my ruler, and, and the relationship between the two don't change. The, the, the amount of profit we make for every generator and for alternator does not change. So if I take this line and I just merely push it out, let's say out to this point. Hypothetical line right there. This line here is further away from the origin. I'm making more generators. I'm making more alternators. So therefore, I'm making more money. This line here is better. And I keep doing that. And I keep pushing out because making more and more generators and alternators means I make more money. So I reach the first corner point solution where I'm just in the uh, alternator business, no generators. Right? And that's still better than where I started, but I note that there's lots of areas in the feasible region or I can make more generators or more alternators and hence make more money. So I keep going. I keep pushing out parallel shifting that line. Every parallel shift involves an increase in the amount of profit. I keep going, I keep going, pushing out, pushing out, pushing out. And I get to the next corner point solution. Now it's better than where I've been, but I got a little bit more area to go. And so I go out, and I go out, and I go out. And finally, I reach the edge. Right? I can't go any further because then I'm outside the feasible area. Right? I, I, I just, I can't, that doesn't satisfy all the constraints, all my requirements. And so here is our optimal solution. Right? Furthest away from the origin, right? Which meaning I'm making the most or the maximum amount of profit possible but still within the feasible region, right? Still satisfying and complying with all the constraints, okay? So my best choice, my optimal solution is I make 130 generators and I get out of the alternator business. Okay? My profit in that case is the 250 
times by the 130. And it's equal to $32,500. Okay. So there's my maximum profit. I'm completely in the generator business. And this, so this interpretation is I get out of the alternator business. Okay. And there you go. There, we're all done. We've done the linear programming problem right from the very beginning to solving it graphically. Let's go do this for the next one, which looks holy cow, big and nasty and ugly. Ugly. It looks ugly. It's got lots of stuff in it. But remember, we have our three-point plan, right? Decision variable. Right, so I know that I'm going to start this process off thinking of what, what am I deciding on? What is it that I want to know that I don't already know? Right, and then I'm going to start to think of what's my objective? Am I maximizing something or am I minimizing something? And then from there, I roll through and into my constraints. Okay, I will leave that for the next segment. So building the excitement. See you on the next question.